really home performance, which is which comes down to two things: temperature and relative humidity. That's that's what we're talking about in home performance. We want we want warm and dry. That's that's what we want. When we look at, at, at home performance, we look we need to look at four elements and or, or four performance parts, I guess, which, which come back to these two things, temperature and relative humidity. So on the temperature side, we need to look at how the building controls its heat loss and then how we heat it. And that's going to determine the temperature range that the house is going to be in. And on the other side of things, we need to look at how we control moisture in that building or that house, and then how we change the air in that house because we've got a ventilator. So if we, if we look at those four components, um, those four components have got to be in balance. I can't, it makes no sense to come into your house and say, well, you need R10 in the ceiling and R8 in the walls and R2 in the windows. You need triple glazing and uh, that makes no sense. You, you can't, there's no point in overemphasizing insulation or, or controlling heat loss. And, I, and there's no point in me coming into your home and saying, you need 10 heat pumps or three wood burners. You wouldn't, you wouldn't overheat a house. That wouldn't be good building performance practice or advice. And the same with moisture control and ventilation. I, why would you overventilate a house? Yes, you need to ventilate a house. Yes, you need clean, fresh air in a house every single day if you can. Yeah, so the, so the way to operate a home is to do those, those four key performance areas in, in balance. You know, it's kind of like a table. You don't want one leg longer than the others. You've kind of got to, you know, you don't want to be heating a room up and then changing the air. So, there's, you know, you've got to think about these things a little bit, but it's, but it's not rocket science. So really the ways to control moisture in a home are not to keep flushing that warm air out of the building, but it's to stop the moisture getting into the home in the first place. So there's, internal sources of moisture and external sources of moisture and it's kind of like it's like an awful lot of things to do with building performance if we actually get the basics right we don't need to buy another bolt-on thing to try and fix the problem that we still haven't fixed in the first place so external moisture sources you need to get a ground vapor barrier under your house if it's good enough for every rental property in this country it's good enough for every property in this country so get your GVBs installed under your houses. The amount of moisture that comes through that subfloor space and can get sucked into the house is, is enormous. Brands tells us 30 liters a day in that subfloor space area. That, that's a, a huge potential of moisture to be sucked into the house. Overhanging trees, foliage, all tight up against the house. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a plant lover, but we've got to allow the air circulation around our houses and particularly that subfloor space. And we've got to allow the sunshine into the outside of our houses. If your house is sitting right next to a huge moisture source, of course, it's going to be damp inside. Moisture is kind of like heat. It'll flow from the wetter to the drier part, just, you know, through the air movement. So, you know, the, the, I like to use exaggeration. So if your house was floating on pontoons in a lake, do you think it would be damp inside? Of course it would, but you know, and if it was sitting on a gravel bed with nothing around it, it would be much drier. Now, obviously we don't want to live in either of those situations, but that's, I use that power of exaggeration to say, look, clear the foliage around your house, make the outside as dry as you possibly can. Maintain your gutters, make sure your downspouts are not putting great big puddles of water right underneath or next to your house. Inside your house, and this is really where a lot of the work needs to be done in this country. We, you know, anybody gets that their house is cold, but the, but the moisture thing is far more complex. We got kitchens, bathrooms, and laundry. And if we look at a kitchen, you know, cooking a meal might be half a litre of moisture, or it might be up to three litres of moisture per day. So that's, you know, as I say to people, how would you feel if I popped round of a cold winter's evening with a couple of, you know, litre and a half Coke bottles full of water and just sprayed them around the lounge? Would that be a good thing? And people go, no, you crazy fool, that would be a stupid thing. And I go, well, that's what you're doing when you're cooking without a range hood that, that's effectively getting that moisture out. Showering, that's about half a litre per person per day. So if you've got four people in a home, 
That's another two litres. So there's Ian with his little spray bottles in the hallway and in the bedroom spraying another two litres of water around. And if we dry our laundry inside, you know, you take a, a full load of washing in the winter, you know, if you've got four or five in your whanau, that's a full load of washing probably every day, and you dry that on a rack in your lounge, that's up to five litres of water. So the problem is not keep changing the air in the house to get rid of the moisture in the air. It's don't put the moisture into the air in the first place. Get yourself a big rain short. If it's a rental, you have to have that now anyway. So if you're, if you're thinking it's, it's only people that rent that make steam when they're cooking, you know, get one for yourself. A range hood is, I don't know, $500 and probably, probably three or $400 to install on top of that, maybe another 500. So there's a thousand that's cheaper than a positive pressure system. A bathroom extractor fan, well, they're probably a couple of hundred dollars to buy and, a, and three or four hundred to install. That's cheaper than, so now we're up to 1700 maybe. And a vented dryer. I can, buy, I can buy a vented dryer for $500. So for half the cost of a, of a positive pressure ventilation system, we can actually get rid of most of the moisture in the house at source before it even becomes a problem. Rather than trying to deal with it all later and once it's kind of affected the whole house or infected the whole house, if you like. So, so dealing with moisture at source is really the key. There's a couple of things we can't deal with, which is, you know, one is breathing. People insist on breathing all winter long. It's a bit of a problem in home performance. <laughs> so there's nothing we can do about that. So we've got to focus on the things that we can do something about, which is, you know, uh, our cooking, our washing and our laundry facilities inside the home. And then you combine that with good ventilation practices, which, um, you know, which really is... <laughs> free and easy and every house has that system already installed in it which is windows and doors all they need to do is be operated and there seems to be this kind of idea out there that we're not responsible enough to operate our own homes that it has to be on this automatic thing I, you know we can drive cars we can raise children and feed ourselves god forbid that we can't be taught to open windows and doors to to ventilate our homes i don't hold with this idea that it's it's too complicated in our modern lives. We still manage to cook our breakfast and clean our teeth and go to the bathroom. But we, we've got plenty of time to open our windows and doors fully for 20 minutes a day. There's, there's nothing more effective than opening windows and doors wide to change air in a building. That is proven pretty conclusively. You want to change the air in the room? Open up the French doors and the big windows wide and, and lots of part of the house.